Bonjour, hello. Good morning. Time is an invisible river. It flows around us, in us, through us. We float in it and down it. And yet we're completely unaware of time. We don't feel time against our skin the way we do the wind. Nor does time smell or make any noise. And we certainly can't see time. And yet we know time exists. We know that because we remember yesterday. And we remember that yesterday we were thinking about tomorrow, which is today. And tomorrow it will be yesterday. There, that proves the existence of time. If I'm aware of yesterday and today, and have in my memory the recollection of a great number of tomorrows that became todays, that means I exist in the river of time. That's quite a feat to prove the existence of something that we can't feel, smell, taste, see, or touch. We are otherwise entirely empirical creatures. We mostly believe what we see. How did we do that, prove the existence of time? By creating time categories. We've already used three, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. There are others, the days of the week, the months of the year, the years of the century. We have finer ones too, the hours of the day, the minutes of the hour, the seconds of the minute. I have 10 minutes to make a simple idea clear to you. I must fit myself into that tiny wedge of time. Now, time, despite being such a smooth operator, is actually amazingly corrosive. Time wears everything down. Time will wear a mountain into rubble, will turn a sea into a dry plain, will turn a young person into an old person, will turn unforgettable moments into blurs of amnesia. Time is the ultimate carnivore. It eats everything. We accept this, but only partly. We accept that the humdrum part of our lives be cast into oblivion, those dull, repetitive parts of our lives that are just a means to an end, our daily ablutions, cleaning the house, doing the dishes, and so on. All that we are willing to forget. But what about events that tower above the mundane? Do we want to abandon everything to time? We don't. And so we have history. We have museums. We have photographs. We have stories. We have 101 devices to pluck this or that from the dark jaws of time. One of these devices is the birthday. Out of that nebula of time, we say that this particular day, say June 25th for me, or July 1st for our country, is a birthday. The day of a birth that we feel is worth celebrating. So we celebrate it. But how do we celebrate it? How is the immaterial celebrated? With the material. In that wispy flowing river called time, we place birthday presents. Big, gaudily wrapped things, concrete things, that a child can grasp, enjoy, understand, and remember. Children remember their birthdays because of the presents they receive. The senseless event, the event that hides from our senses, is marked and made real by a vividly sensed present, object, a choo-choo train, a nice dress, something like that. We adults are no different nor our countries. We have to place at the center of a birthday an object. My idea to you today is that to celebrate Canada's sesquicentennial, I love that word, sesquicentennial, we must come up with an object. And the object I have in mind to celebrate Canada's 150th birthday is a very mundane one. It's a chair. Why a chair? Because the chair is an object rich in meaning. A chair is something welcome, 
We can sit on a chair. That's what you're doing right now. We can talk to others while sitting on a chair. We invite people to sit down on a chair. A chair is an open invitation. Isn't that what Canada is? An open invitation. We have proved to be a remarkably open country, having moved from a narrow outpost of, outpost of the British Empire to a vibrant, amazingly multicultural country. So, where possible, in parks perhaps, or in the center of a square, we would want many chairs. A chair, when empty, is also a symbol of absence. That is the case with Penn. Penn is an international human rights organization that concerns itself more specifically with freedom of expression and the rights and freedoms of writers. <clears throat> At any pen event you go to, there will always be an empty chair on the stage to symbolize an imprisoned writer somewhere who couldn't be with us. The empty chair marks the absence of someone. And Canada is also about absent ones. For example, the many First Nations who were disregarded, lied to, disrespected, ignored onto death, while European settlers busily stole their land wrecked their ecosystem, and destroyed their civilizations. The chair to celebrate Canada's sesquicentennial would also symbolize those who aren't there to sit with us to join in the birthday party. There are many other possible ways that the chair can mean something to you. I imagine concretely, I imagine small chairs climbing up the sides of a building, chairs nesting in trees, more conventional chairs could be set, as I said, in parks or along streets, inviting people to sit down and take a breather, to take stock of their lives. Perhaps a huge chair inviting someone from outer space, just harking that thing in St. Paul's, Alberta, was it? The big landing pad? Maybe a huge chair inviting someone from outer space, or possibly a god, to come and sit down. Each chair, whatever its size, would be a rec of a recognizable style or color, something dis distinctly sesquicentennial. Now, if you don't like the idea of the chair, that's fine. The point is that to, to, to plant something in the river of time that's going to be memorable, it has to be an object. It can't just be words or programs or, you know, speeches. If we want it to last, if in, in 50 years down the road we want to look back and remember 2017, it has to be rooted in an object. And I was trying, as I was working on this in the last few days, to think of the object that would best symbolize, symbolize this country. And I thought of the chair. Thank you. <laughs>